we, we started Colossians a couple weeks ago, and uh, two weeks ago we were into the second section. We talked a little bit about the fact that Paul writing letters, uh, most all of them to churches, a couple of them to individuals, although the church to uh, the, the letter to Philemon uh, is to Philemon and a lady, and it sounds like a young man, and to the church that meets at your house. So it's it's a personal letter addressed to the church that meets at your house. Uh, his, his letters tend to follow the format of Greco-Roman letters, which would begin with the name of the author and some kind of expansion if the person wanted to say other things about themselves to the recipients. Then the name of the recipients, uh, and that might be expanded. Then a uh, greeting, and uh, then most Greco-Roman letters had a Thanksgiving section either a prayer report or a thanksgiving section, and the letter to Colossians, most all of Paul's letters do. Uh, the letters of Paul that don't <coughs> are rare enough they call our attention and we wonder what's going on here. For example, Galatians. There's no I thank God for any of you kind of stuff in the letter of Galatians, and so we wonder well, what's that mean in, in terms of what's <coughs> happening there. Colossians, a thanksgiving report. And we started into that two weeks ago. Uh, in our prayers, we, for you, we always thank God, which, which struck me as a uh, couple of fascinating things are revealed there. That uh, Maybe, well, I think this is part of what Susan and others talked about on, on this reading that you're doing now in the Community Bible Experience, the, the edition there. Uh, we read certain things in the formats of that we're used to in scripture, and thus uh, our eyes just sort of pass over. Uh, yeah, I've seen that, I've seen that, yeah, I know what that's about. Uh, and the change of format, which by the way, a change of language tends to do that to you too. Um, um, I, I, I discover things in Greek all the time that, I, wow, why isn't that in the English text? And I go look, and it is. I, I just didn't pay attention to it in English because, uh, oh, I know this, I know this. I, you don't work as hard in your own language. I discovered talking to one of my sisters uh, that the same experience happens for her in, in Spanish or in French, uh, reading the text in that other language. She's working harder for all the clues of meaning. A and uh, so uh, one of the things that I just was struck by, uh, uh, f first of all, this tells us that Paul prays for these people on a regular basis. Uh, that that's a part of his prayer life, if you want to call it that, is to be regularly, consistently praying for these people. And it happens enough of his letters, uh, apparently he prays for all the churches that he has acquaintance with. And in his prayers, what does he do always? He gives thanks. He always gives thanks. Which strikes me as a, a, another important thing because, not to chastise us, but we were full of petitions and short on praises today. <laughs> Uh, and some days it's the other way around, but most of the time uh, we are more attentive to the things we want to have happen than we are thankful for the things that are good and well and going on. Um, I've tried to remember that, uh, carrying books and uh, removing furniture and all that stuff this week. Uh, how, how thankful I should be, uh, having been even in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Resources available to me that are not available to those folks. Uh, even uh, because I speak English and read English, resources available to me, not me. Uh, I, I'm also teaching, uh, I just started Friday night, I'm teaching for the District School of Ministry in Spanish, a class for the Spanish people trying to get ordination and stuff. Uh, six to ten for a week is how it goes. And because of Labor Day, the first day was Friday and then I'll do from Tuesday to Friday this coming week. But one of the objectives and one, in one of the lessons that I'm supposed to teach was to give them a, a panoramic overview of how the Bible came into being the, in Spanish that they have. Well, I, I'm not too sure of what happened between about 1530 and 1920 or something in Spanish Bible stuff. I, 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 I can rip off probably a hundred versions in English that happened from 18, uh, 1380 to uh, most recently, but I don't know that in Spanish, a and uh, near as I can tell, not nearly, nearly, nearly as many available to them as are available to us. Um, 
and uh, in terms even those that have been done accessibility to people um, and that accessibility works at multiple levels uh, there's a I'm guessing it's a pretty good translation uh, done by a Catholic group of Catholic priests that in uh, in the Holy Land uh, into French called the Jerusalem Bible some of mm -hmm. you have seen the English one mm -hmm. and from the French version they've translated into English and German and Spanish and Portuguese and I don't know what all else uh, and I saw that in a bookstore in San Juan Puerto Rico uh, Sunday but in a sense it's not accessible to our people because as soon as they see Catholic they've been taught don't don't look at that don't read that and, and so here's an excellent sort of resource unavailable to them because of uh, for lack of a better term ideology uh, financial reason, all kind of stuff so so much to be thankful for and uh, Paul seems to have that captured that <coughs> idea in my prayers I always give thanks for y'all. Uh, and what is it that he gives thanks? We talked about this. We've heard of your faith in Christ and of the love you have for all the saints and we talked about that in terms of uh, whatever faith or faithfulness with City Mejor Acero Español. We talked about that with reference to love of God, faith in Christ, faithfulness of Christ, and love of neighbor in terms of your love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, which is where we ended up last week talking about that. Um, and, and I think I suggested that there may have been more in mind, a bigger uh, picture than just, uh, oh, go to heaven when I die, but, but a sense of the whole victory of God over this present evil age, of the kingdom of God, uh, that kind of thing, uh, perhaps as a part of the larger hope. Uh, and of the glorious triumph of God's reign and rule as opposed to what's happening in this world. Uh, we will encounter someday in uh, chapter 1, verse 20, 27 or 29, something like that. Uh, Christ in you the hope of glory. Uh, we'll get there. Okay. So, you have heard of this hope. Uh, before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. So, uh, let's read together verses 3 through 8, and then we'll pick up with that question in verse 6 uh, of, of what he sees this hope accomplishing. Okay, let's read together. In our, our prayers, prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ, Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it, and truly comprehended the grace of God. This is learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is the faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Well, Paul says that the Corinthians, the Colossians, I'm sorry, had previously heard of this hope in the word of truth of the gospel. Uh, then in verse 6, there's an effect, he says, that comes out of that. And what's that effect? Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit and growing. What do you think he means when he talks about the gospel bearing fruit and growing? Are those two separate things, bearing fruit and growing, or are they two ways of saying the same thing? Or are there other options you want to put on the table? Marcia? I think there are two different things. I think they could be the same, but I think that what he's saying is bearing fruit is witnessing to other people and they're becoming Christians, and the Christians that they have are growing. But it all could be the same. Okay, so you are taking the growing as kind of internal spiritual growth mm -hmm. and the bearing fruit as the kind of uh, enlargement of the church, uh, evangelism, so to speak, successful evangelism. Yeah, and the growing like the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay, okay, Jess? But it says growing in the whole world. So this seems to be a different kind of reference, that the growth is indeed permeating, the gospel is permeating 
through the whole world. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, that probably is another question. Uh, is in the whole world only go with growing, or does it go with bearing fruit too? <laughs> uh, we have a uh, pretty long tradition of connecting bearing fruit to evangelism, uh, mm -hmm. church growth, numerical growth kind of thing. Um, where there is, this doesn't tell us. Uh, where there are passages that tell us what the bearing fruit means, it, it always is bearing fruit in terms of some kind of spiritual quality. Righteousness in Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Um, so that the possibility here is bearing fruit means that there's, there, there are changed lives happening. Uh, the growing in the whole world could have numerical reference to the spread of the gospel. Uh, I probably just jabbered about the date of Colossians since it's a debated date um, but it certainly uh, I I if Paul is the author it's certainly no later than uh, the mid 60s uh, that's the zero 60s not the 1960s <laughs> that were referenced today uh, um, possibly as early as the mid 50s if there's an efficient <coughs> imprisonment uh, which uh, only a few of us weird ducks think that's likely. Uh, so, nevertheless, uh, near as we can tell, the church, the Christian movement, is still relatively small. But it seems to be growing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> not not just it, it grows in a particular place, but but it also uh, it's like those plants that send out. Uh, Shoots. Things that then start another one, and then starts right. another one. You know, strawberries and apparently our sweet potatoes are doing something like that. Um, send out runners that then start a new plant. That send out runners that start a new plant. That, that the church seems to be doing something like that. Uh, Paul, uh, we can't tell for sure if if this is a reality. But by the time you get into the, mm, well, by the time you get to. Uh, uh, Paul arriving in Corinth uh, around 50, uh, you begin to get the sense that he's developed a strategy of going to larger cities, knowing that cities are like the uh, hub of wagon wheels of people coming and going, and, and that his ministry is not in a church building much, but his ministry is in a marketplace. Uh, he's a leather worker, which means people from all kinds of places coming there will be visit. So if he's working in the market and preaching during the lunch hour uh, or the afternoon rest time or whatever, uh, he's going to be making contact with folks from all kinds of places. A and most folks think that that's how the church at Colossae got planted, is this guy named Epaphras that we, find in, that we meet in verse 7, that he was in Ephesus. Epaphras was in Ephesus, uh, who knows why, business, something, and heard Paul speak, preach, got invited to a, get a meeting of believers or something, and became converted, and he took the church back to Colossae. And, and so that was the kind of the, the church planting model, was hub with spokes going out in a variety of kinds of directions. And, and uh, near as we can tell, all of these churches met in houses, which means they're running, to use our word, uh, they're running probably less than 100 folks because they'll fit in a house. A and uh, not all the houses were big. Uh, rich folks could have put 100 people in their house, but a lot of poor people, uh, 20 or 30 or 40, would have been uncomfortably close for us Americans. <laughs> and so uh, lots of little places, but they're happening more and more places. Jess? Can you tie that, that reference in uh, verse uh, 5, 6, uh, with verses 28 and 29? same chapter. So everywhere we go, we talk about Christ to all who will listen. Warn everyone, teaching everyone. We want to present everyone to God, perfect because of what Christ Jesus has done for them. Which, in that case, seems to be quite visibly uh, a, a going about and preaching for the sake of evangelizing. So yep. are the two connected? I'm suspecting so. Yeah. 
another factor no evidence of any significant systemic persecution up to this point so you have a movement that's been transformative in lives of people there's no counter pressure yet on them to shut up a and so that kind of uh, all uh, it, it comes into conversations everywhere they go a and uh, a part of what we know in many ways, the first century, first Christian century, the first century AD, was as mobile in the sense of people traveling as any time before or after uh, until uh, the modern era. Uh, the Roman road system uh, increased, you wouldn't believe it if you saw them, but in their minds, uh, bigger and better boats, they can travel by boat safer. Uh, commerce happening all across the Mediterranean. The whole Roman Empire uh, created this networking set of potential that, that the Romans encouraged and developed uh, for their own purposes, but that the church then made use of. Mm -hmm. a and so you had Christian businessmen who moved from city to city on their business. A a and apparently very early the Christian believers developed a symbol of just putting a fish on the door of a house where there were believers there and where a meeting would happen. A and so a businessman coming into town sees a fish on the house and if he's a believer he knows he should show up there uh, Sunday. Uh, there'll, there'll be a meeting there. Uh, a and so uh, he will talk to folks in the course of his business uh, and ask about, do you know any people that are uh, followers of Jesus Christ? Because religion was a popular subject in those days. Uh, the world of the Greco-Roman world was not um, religion was a fine cultural thing. Uh, they they practiced as many of them as they could. Uh, they uh, it, there, there was no sense that religion should impact your life actually, uh, but that you should uh, make as many gods happy as you possibly could was considered a good thing, and so you talked well of gods. And if there was a little uh, little thing you might do of a sacrifice or a sort of a observation, uh, you, you would do that, which, which was part of the, the state religion, so to speak, of the time, that you were supposed to worship the gods of the city and the gods of Rome. And, and there were certain days you did little sacrifices for that, and it was like, it was your public duty. And, and it was part of the reason that when Christians refused to do that eventually, the persecution arose because they were being bad citizens which was thought to mean you might bring <laughs> hurricanes <laughs> or <laughs> droughts or forest fires or whatever, tornadoes or something on us if you don't keep the gods happy. And so that started the process of Christians becoming unpopular. That probably hasn't happened quite yet. It's just starting to develop. Uh, Tom? I know the Gospels per se weren't formed yet and weren't recorded, yeah. but there's an echo there of a lot of the parables of, of Jesus and sayings of Jesus about bearing fruit. Um, it seems like there's a there's an echo of yep. reverberance between the two. Yep. So it's not, maybe they've been kind of outlined to some extent. Or we, we think there was oral preaching of gospel material. Um, the similarity of the materials in Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, Maybe simply it was used to be interpreted only as a literary thing, but uh, how does the first one get their literary thing to start with? Uh, and those seem to be well-formed, developed sort of patterns of teaching, and you will find in various places in Paul, he'll talk about the pattern of teaching to which you have been handed over. Uh, there's a sense that, uh, and what that, content exactly might have been would vary from place to place depending on who the founding evangelist was and what they knew of those stories, how many of them they knew. But yeah, there, there's, that's one of the things, uh, we, we would love to know more and there just isn't data uh, to try to explain how it works, but we can sort of hear echoes or smell aromas of or something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, so it's bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, and what else? been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it 
<coughs> so what does that suggest? They're a growing population as far as spiritual growth. Yeah, at least in a, some kind of spiritual sense, there is <coughs> fruit growing, fruit bearing happening in them. Uh, part of it, I suppose you can see, we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. That would be some evidence then, wouldn't it, of the uh, gospel bearing fruit among themselves? Uh, in the sense that what's happening worldwide is happening amongst them too? Maybe that's. Well, a couple of things. M maybe that's why we need to be aware of what's happening outside ourselves, uh, to have a world vision. A and uh, to be uh, shamelessly Nazarene for a moment, uh, w one of the glorious things of being a global church, th that we have connections with Christians in Africa and Bangladesh and uh, South America mm -hmm. and all kinds of places, that, that there's a, a network of bearing fruit and growing in all those places and there's stuff that happens to us and impacts us and helps us to grow too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jenny. Actually, that's kind of where I was going to go. It seemed to me that it, that would be a great encouragement to me if I was stuck in that big town by myself to hear that, you know, and I'd say, oh, tell me about it, tell me about it, tell me what's going on. That would be fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if any yes. other Nazarenes had this experience. Uh, I don't know if I did. Uh, the youth group Adventures. of the Nazarene Church we started attending when I went, started high school had uh, uh, th three regular people, uh, me and my, well, two regular people, me and my sister, and a guy who attended once in a while whose mother was the church organist, and so sometimes he, she came on Sunday night, and there he was. Uh, and, and so I had this sense of being isolated. Uh, I'm the only one uh, my age in this church. Um, and, and to go to uh, tryouts to, uh, to the district impact team and all of a sudden to be a part of something so much larger that was district-wide. And I managed to miss the whole International Institute kind of thing, uh, which would have even more said, wow, this is, this is a bigger thing than our little church. This is a bigger thing than my mom and dad making me go to church every time the doors are open. This is something important. Yeah. Yeah. And from the day you heard it, it's been happening. Uh, when does grace start in a person's life? Before he comes to Christ. Yeah. It's just there. It's planted in their Yeah. It, 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 and the, the moment they heard, they had a, a handle, I guess you could say, or a peg to hang it on, uh, that this grace of God is now increasing and increasing. Uh, the other point, and truly comprehended. Um, and I'll save that for a little bit later. Not today, I won't. <laughs> uh, truly comprehended the grace of God. Uh, truly implies what? So that you correctly understood. Mm -hmm. Rather, okay. truly, as opposed to being distracted off of other beliefs and systems. We don't know for sure. Um, let's see. I mean, it's not. Here's the Greek word right here. You can cover up the first three letters and translate it exactly the same way. What? Pardon? What? She doesn't read really Greek. I missed it. Yeah, we don't read Greek. You can't read Greek. This, this word right here. This word right here. Uh, that's what, what I... What is that word? What is it? Epigenotoli. Oh. Truly comprehended. Comprehended. Learned. Knew. Came to know. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and, and those first three letters are an intensifier, which is gives this the, the, the cause this translation to choose the word truly Very or intense. really. Very, really uh, what? Intensely. Yeah, you intensely or actually or, a, 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 and so at least some folks are wondering if Paul is saying there are folks at Colossae. The pro Colossae. The problem is they talk about knowing God and knowing grace and knowing the gospel. But their knowing, unlike your friend, is headed off in a direction that um, 
Well, he, he wants to for them to truly know, or rightly know, to emphatically know the correct thing, uh, as opposed to what they think is the correct thing. A and so this is the first little possible hint. Not, not every scholar agrees that that prefix uh, is addressing the problem, but it, it's a fascinating fact that uh, both in noun and verbal form, that prefix keeps popping up in the verb know or the noun to knowledge kind of thing. Okay? Uh, so it may be uh, you started right, <laughs> but now you need to be pulled back into the true uh, knowledge of this. Okay? Now, this you learned from Epaphras. Uh, this is one of a set of a couple of verses that make us think Epaphras was the person who founded the church. Now, Paul has no critique of Epaphras, does he? Beloved fellow servant, faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, he has made known to you, made known to us your love in the Spirit. Uh, Epaphras has been the pipeline of information from Paul with the gospel to the Colossians and from the Colossians with all of their life in Christ, their church life, back to Paul. Uh, so we presume that things that Epaphras has told Paul are the reasons that Paul is writing this letter. Okay. Is the we? Pardon? He refers to we all the time here. Yeah, I kept wondering about that in the beginning. He talks about we even pray. Nah. The, the we at least is Paul and Timothy. And our brother. Who is our brother. Timothy. Yeah. Um, there may have been others like Timothy around. Um, Depending on where he wrote it from, yeah. it could be the church you there. Think yeah, reason? yeah. Uh, I got in a bad habit some years ago with the Corinthian correspondence of where there's lots of we's, uh, calling it the Apostolic Band, uh, <laughs> meaning <laughs> Apostolic, the group with Paul. <laughs> and so my students all. So he had a rock group or what? <laughs> uh, called the Apostolic Band. Uh, th 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 there's a corporateness to much of Paul's writings that we don't always acknowledge. A and the more rare thing that we assume all the time is when he makes reference to himself personally. Those little autobiographical sections. Well, uh, what he says about what Epaphras has done, made known to us your love. Their love for whom? And each other, the each other's already been mentioned at the beginning, earlier in the in the letter. Uh, probably love of God, love of Christ. Uh, yeah, perhaps love for Paul as them loving the church. That would be a part of it. And uh, one of the few references to the Spirit actually in this book, in the Spirit. Does that describe the context in which the love happens? Or is it describe the way in which Epaphras made this information known to Paul? Or something else? Good, you'll have something to think about this week. Uh, most frequently, Paul will use the phrase, in Christ. I think he means something pretty similar to in Christ when he says, in the spirit here. But, uh, yes, Mark, last word. I really appreciated your pointing out the truly know, the epi and mm -hmm. my, the Greek word for knowledge. Um, because there's a principle in curriculum and instruction that people can know enough that it prevents them from truly knowing something. Yeah. A little knowledge can interfere yeah. with the fullness of knowledge. And, you know, my prayer is, may the Lord help us always strive for the fullness of God. Which uh, is a dangerous thing yeah. in several ways. Uh, one of which is it won't let any of us off any hook. Which is a part of the reason we tend to not know it, and not want to know it. it. We develop coping mechanisms that don't cause us to be challenged or don't allow us to be exposed. And so, well, Father, we are thankful for your word. Uh, at
the gospel not borne <coughs> fruit and grown throughout the world in the first century, it probably would have died and we would never have been impacted by it. So we ask that uh, you would help us to be people who bear fruit and who grow, but not in some kind of isolated, spiritual, interiorized way only, but that we are people who are comfortable sharing our faith, uh, making response, uh, giving a reason for the hope that we have, and uh, doing it without uh, finding ourselves hating or despising or condemning uh, someone else who hasn't received the grace yet that you've made available to us. Uh, teach us to uh, live in the Spirit, in Christ, in confidence that your grace is sufficient for us uh, to uh, truly know your will. We ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Okay.